waiting to be introduced. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so you can find the introducers. The show will begin. <laughs> Management has left the building, which is not a good sign. Um, welcome everyone to the last uh, lecture performance yeah. of our day of lecture performance. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Don, John McKenzie and Anita Spurgey. <laughs> if I may, since you asked me to introduce you, uh, John's book has been one of the reasons um, I got interested in the idea of the performance of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, we might talk about it later. Uh, Anita Sturgis, I met her recently and it was a pleasure uh, to get to know her. I'm very excited that you're here, and thank you very much for coming. Right. Oh, and the name of the performance, yeah. lecture performance is uh, Thought Action Figures, Episode 11, Cosmograms. Cheers. John McKenzie, and I want to thank Amir and uh, Mara for inviting us here. And I want to also thank Mike for all the technical assistance he is about to provide for us. Um, this performance tonight is the second in a series called Thought Action Figures. And actually, as we we're seeing the performances going on before, I think it connects well with many of the things that uh, we've seen uh, just now. This comes out of a uh, long, my long interest and Anetta's long interest in media and performance and the auto-historical, and that auto part actually might feed well into the discussion of the Foucault performance we saw a little bit earlier. So, without any further ado, welcome, and we'll start. such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city. In the map of the empire, the entirety of the province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied. And the Titanic's field struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with. following generations, who were not so fond of the study of photography as their forebears had been, saw that that vast map was useless. And not without some hideousness was it that they delivered it up to the intimacies of sun and winters. Thank you. 
parts of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that land, inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land, there is no other relic of the disciplines of geography. centuries, we have thought that we think in ideas, ideal forms best seen in logic or logos. It was Plato who taught us this, and today it's hard to imagine thinking in anything but ideas. Or is it? <laughs> when Plato threw the poets out of the Republic, it wasn't towards standing at lecterns, reciting poems to solemn audiences. No, it was Rhapsodists whose song and dance and music transmitted Homeric wisdom to enchanted audiences. Plato called this mimesis, or enchantment, which he enlightened to pharmacon or poison. Homeric knowledge, according to Plato, worked by images and myths and it at best produced doxa of common knowledge, but not true epistem, true knowledge which can only be gained by the method of dialectics, which he also called pharmacon, but now he meant medicine. Dialectics, this method, would save Athens' youth from the botchery of Homeric wisdom. The path to epistemic knowledge passed through the academy, which Plato had established for the youth of Athens. This method of dialectics, this image of thought as talking to oneself, asking questions and answers, that is dialectics, this would cure Athens' youth of this enchanting mimesis. Thus our universe and our universities are ruled by ideas and logic. Today, however, with the mashup of scholars and rappers, ideas and logic give way to thought action figures. It's <laughs> not another lecture. What is this? Standing at the lectern, reciting the text you prepared in advance. And what is a lecture anyway? Somebody on stage reciting a text that he wrote beforehand, and maybe they get like super creative, and then they have these little notes, and they read some little notes, and they have video or some kind of images or pictures from keynote. And what about you? Do you think you're thinking just because you're sitting there? Do you think you have a true being? True ontos, just sitting there and watching somebody reciting a lecture before you. Cogito ergo sum. You sit, therefore you think, therefore you are, therefore you think. Is the birth of vita contemplativa this idea of thought that you're just sitting there and thinking? It is, in fact, the Rodin's thinker, the Rodin's thinker, that captures the Western figure, Western thought action figure, 
This question of God action figure is the thinking as contemplating, as sitting lost in thought, thinking closely connected to sitting, the technology of chairs, of reading, of trunks, and even toilets. Thinking machine. Thinking machine. <laughs> and by the way, even for the mentioned Plato, it wasn't really about sitting and thinking, you know? Does anyone of you remember Symposium, Plato's famous work on love? Well, Symposium comes from the Greek word which means to drink together. So it was really about lounging, lying down together, drinking, eating, talking, and especially thinking together in a really fun and relaxed way. So, stretch your bodies a bit in those chairs. They're not very comfortable, but try to move yourself a little bit. Lean onto each other. You don't have to be shy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get yourself in motion a bit. And then you can just find the most comfortable comfortable position for yourself and lay back and enjoy the show. And perhaps later tonight we can go to drink together. Eureka! Walking is another important thought action figure. In fact, Aristotle's peripatetic method derived from his walking. Apparently, he lectured while walking. <laughs> Nietzsche wrote all of his philosophy while walking through the mountains on little notebooks. And he ridiculed Kant for just sitting there and thinking. Later, Benjamin gives us the image of the planeur walking through the streets of Paris, bedazzled by the commodities around him. Even the Tarsus, for him, the method, the very word method comes from walking. It comes from meta, across or behind, and chodos, which means away. So method, according to Descartes, who basically said the modern science, comes with four steps, following the steps of knowledge. And those are accept only clear and distinct ideas, divide each problem into paths, order your thoughts from simple to complex, and check your work for oversights. Oops. <laughs> it's modern in the age of all Decker's order steps, thought action figures meander in a very, very different way. After all, what is recognized as thinking? And who decides?
in the modern era. <laughs> Descartes rebooted eidos as ideas, and the opposition of episteme and doxa helped define the West relationship with its other. They would also define the university's relationship with popular culture, which it approaches suspiciously as image-laden, mystifying, and ideological. Contemporary performance, however, opens the possibility of thinking beyond both image and idea, story and logic, ritual and theater. Just as the digital displaces the opposition of speech and writing, orality and literacy, all performance is electronic. <clears throat> and the mashup of images and ideas enables us to think otherwise, to think and act precisely through thought action figures. Now, while ideation happens through induction and deduction by specifying and generalizing, figuration adds abduction and conduction, that is, leaps and revelations. And what about a female thinker, huh? Taking a position at the lectern for female thinker that has been an ongoing problem, but that's an ongoing struggle, but that's just one side of that problem. We also have an underlying question. Why is the Western model of thought the only model that we recognized as legitimate knowledge? In contrast with rational, universal, objective, logocentric, that was attributed traditionally to male, historically, the feminine knowledge was linked to the sensual, experiential, the occult, the magical, the spiritual. Think of oracles, witches, bird givers, home keepers, whores and mothers and other fake dichotomies. What about other knowledges and other epistemologies? that have been subjugated to the colonial epistemic violence of the logocentric knowledge. All embodied knowledges, what about all embodied knowledges, all animisms pushed aside by Western logocentric thought and its institutions? Female thinker appears as the essential ladder, not only as a new actor and agent, but also as a carrier of a different kind of knowledge. Her knowledge is situated knowledge. It is inseparable from the agency of knowledge producer. Who am I? Where do I come from? And who am I to bring you this content? How can we think female thought action figure or a feminine thought action figure? Well, Thought action figures and such are really not limited to human beings at all. Some of the most powerful thought action figures are plants, animals, inanimate objects, machines, spaceships. The latter parts of animals. Yes. The latter, for instance, <laughs> helps Semitic tribes think about different levels of existence, reaching from Earth up into heaven, Jacob's ladder. Aristotle later came up with the categories, and he divided that ladder into different branches. And the Neoplatonists recognized this as a tree, and this covers our thinking of generalizing and specifying. More recently, the Deleuze and Guattari have, have proposed the rhizome, grass, as a different organization, not just of thought, but of reality. So, stepping back, we can connect the tasks of tree, of ladder, tree, and rhizome as to orality, like literacy and digitality, or to ritual, theater, and performance. So, thought action figures basically function as, a, basically are functional machines, which multiply almost by themselves. I guess it's even more than we had at the beginning of the performance, right? Yes, I have been at it. How do you make yourself a thought action figure? <laughs> so those of you that know my work know that I have been possessed
by Professor Challenger for about 20 years. This figure combines many different things, such as a space shuttle disaster, a 19th century gay scientist by the name of Rutherford, a sci-fi character by the name of Professor Challenger, who Deleuze and Guattari make into another character that turns into a lobster, a 19th century warship, and also Heidegger's challenging forth of the world, the entire world challenged forth through technology. This is an alter ego of mine that I thought I had discovered, but I've come to think it discovered me, and it's been taking me along for a ride. Now, cosmograms allow us to think about how to produce your own thought action figure. My mentor, Greg Omer, come, gives this little structure for generating cosmograms, and it has four different discourses, <laughs> profession, community, family, and popular culture. And in my case, the profession is performance studies, and that figure is Laurie Anderson, who I discovered many years ago who inspired me to invent a language of the future, and that's really why I'm standing here today. In terms of history, my life has really been structured by the space race. I was born in 1960. This structured my whole approach to what it was to be an American. And this battle between capitalism and communism structured my life. In terms of family, that's a picture of me and my brother, and that shows this strange piece where caring becomes scaring, where mothering becomes smothering. I seem to be supporting him in his little uh, walking thing, or else I'm threatening him. Heidegger called the Sorge, care and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And in popular culture, the figure of Jimi Hendrix, besides the whole solo thing, which I'm doing right now, <laughs> he channels an entire <coughs> countercultural movement of the 1960s, which I still feel in my blood and bones. And I know the generation that, that grew up with me still feels that as well. Omer suggested you take these four different discourses, and what you would do is you would populate this with your own, and look for patterns, and out of that pattern for me, <laughs> in some sense he is my dreams and my nightmare. <laughs> through primary psychic processes that were defined as Freud as condensation and displacement. So Freud formulated these processes in the following way. By the process of displacement, one idea may surrender to another its whole quota of catharsis. 
by the process of condensation, it may appropriate the whole catexis of several other ideas. That's <coughs> important. Now, let's try this in a little bit more sappy way. Again. Sappy. By the process of displacement, one thought action figure may surrender to another its whole quota of catexis. By the process of condensation, it may appropriate the whole catexis of several other thought action figures. Thought action figures, they are always created in relation. And these relations are always multiple fluid networks and always, always in motion. They are always transforming each other and transforming into another, each other. Last night I had a dream. And in this dream, the couch was a large machine. A couch as a thought action figure. As a, as a thought action figure that enables us to access the unknown depths of psyche and generate cosmograms. The analyst here appears as a proper thought action figure too because she will become everything and anything, anyone and everyone in the transference that occurs in a room. Psychoanalysis sin is in fact a form of reclining thinking or maybe better reclining thinking together as a way to access the unknown depths of psyche and to make sense of the cosmos while it pours through you. <laughs> How do you make yourself a thought action figure? One way is through repertory cosmograms. <laughs> Benjamin and Ulmer's models are not the only ones, far from it. Over the past half century, figures from Artaud to Tausig <laughs> have explored revelatory practices drawn from religion, poetry, technology, and schizophrenia, as well as non-Western cultures. Other experiments can be found in past and contemporary projects to ritualize theater and re-enchant everyday life. <laughs> Deleuze and Guattari draw on these threads in anti-Oedipus and a thousand plateaus. And when they ask, how do you make yourself a body without organs? They answer, <laughs> with the cosmic <laughs> In anti Oedipus, they write that the body without organs is an egg. It is crisscrossed with axes and thresholds with latitudes and longitudes and geodesic lines, traversed by gradients marking the transitions and the becomings, the destinations of the subject developing along these particular vectors. Their model for this cosmic egg is the Dogon egg, described by French anthropologist Marcel Ruel and Germain Dieterman. They write that perhaps the most important creation of the Dogon god, Ama, was the unformed universe, a body that is said to have held all of the potential seeds or signs of future existence. somewhat quadrangular structure with a rounded point and is filled with unrealized potentiality. Its corners tree figure the four cardinal points of the universe to come. According to Dogon myth, 
some undefined impulse caused the egg to open, allowing it to release a whirlwind that spun silently and scattered its contents in all directions, ultimately forming all the spiraling galaxies of stars and planets. The germs develop first in seven segments of increasing weight, representing the seven fundamental seeds of cultivation. The anthropologists report that these patterns recur in kinship structures, village layouts, indeed throughout the Dogon world. The egg also suggests the gestation of a formation yet to come. Much like Deleuze and Guattari find in Kafka's K-function, his tuning in of 20th century totalitarian regimes to the characters K, Pierre K, Joseph K, and Kafka's own existential writing machine. We thus spell cosmogram with the letter K. So at, at this point in the performance, I was going to connect the, the Dogon egg with the Greek myth of the labyrinth and walking, getting out of, how do you leave the labyrinth of ideation, I guess was the big question. But well, cracks started to appear in the egg. You don't know what you're talking about. 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 <laughs> It appears that the anthropology that the Dogon egg is based upon is uh, a little bit sketchy. <laughs> Grail and Dieterlin, who Guattari drew upon, they wrote a book called The Pale Fox. Do you guys know The Pale Fox? There's an international cult following, a tourist trade, publishing, but subsequent anthropologists could not find this cosmography among the Dogon and alleged that they the original anthropologists had relied on the revelations of just one informant. <laughs> so what do you do with a broken cosmography? The egg has become Humpty Dumpty with the anthropologist arguing <laughs> over the shells. This doesn't keep people from creating cool stuff. The contemporary <laughs> artist lives here in New York, Camille Henro. I think I'm saying that right. Recently did the Pale Fox about four or five years ago, major international exhibition. Doesn't mean she was taken in. I think the way out of this is to think about what's known as willed error or fabulization of the world, which Nietzsche talked about. When the apparent world disappears, so does the real world, or and vice versa, or when the literal world disappears, the metaphoric world also disappears. And what happens is that no matter how silly a myth or a science or a religion might be, it doesn't mean it can't produce truths. It doesn't mean it can produce truths. <laughs>
hope I did. Uh, how about that? Would you like that? To come Woo! out of this place tonight with your own thought action figure. So all you gotta do is employ... Almost Cosmogram. Almost Cosmogram. <laughs> so, you gotta follow those four quadrants. As it was mentioned before, pop culture, profession, family, <laughs> family, family, and community history. So, Not that difficult, huh? No? Yes, although I wrote a book called Performer Outs, so I don't want to put you under any pressure. <laughs> but we're going to spend one minute doing this. Five, four, three, two, one! <laughs> the first thing you want to do is start with profession. Is there a figure in your profession that you are drawn to or perhaps repelled from? In my case, it was Laurie Anderson, but you may have a different figure in mind. The community history section relates to your personal history or a historical figure that has influenced you very much. It could be your own community, a communal practice you've been involved with, or anything really, even some kind of a cultural thing. For family, what you want to draw upon is maybe some incident, a crazy uncle, a crazy aunt, or maybe there's some sort of uh, in incident happening in your psychic life. This is the realm of psychoanalysis, ladies and gentlemen. Pop culture, all those guilty pleasure, all those action figures, all those heroes, superheroes, all those things that you really maybe rather wouldn't have out there. But they Let's stop time. We're gonna stop time right now. <laughs> and let you fill in your four areas. And remember the whole point of this is to start generating your own thought action figures. All right, this is start doing it. Start having revelations, ladies and gentlemen. Revelations, come on, revelations, revelations, revelations. For me, Professor Challenger. For you, who knows? Maybe it's a Dogon egg or a Dogon egg. But don't be influenced by us just because you've seen Dogon eggs tonight. <laughs> what you want to do is overcome your Medusa side self, crack it open. And escape your, from your own labyrinth in your mind. Maybe you've got a broken ideal you're dealing with. Put it back together. century, other thought action figures have emerged, such as the double helix, which changes the way we think about life itself and gives us the model for recombinant creativity. Another one is the Apple desktop. <laughs> Bureaucracy means rule by desktop, and what's happened, we've gone from the old analog to the new digital desktop bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Gorilla Girls <laughs> offer yet another thought action figure, their combination of art, activism, and guerrilla warfare. I bought this wonderful bag in a museum, and they put this on here. You won't believe what comes out of your mouth when you wear a gorilla mask. You won't believe what comes out of your mouth when you wear a gorilla mask.
I remember we come to this part of the performance our house got on fire. when you, we asked you to get up and quit being seated thought action figures join us in a dance <laughs>
Yes? Who's running this? You are. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for doing this, um, spending all this time on uh, this beautiful um, 20 minutes or 30 minutes um, performances. I really appreciate it, and I'm very glad that it all uh, was realized so well. Um, it's very hard for me, and thanks. Um, I really don't know what to do about this Q&A. Um, yeah. It's, uh, what? Let's not do it? I think, so, uh, yeah, some people, like, some, let, let's negotiate with this not doing it and doing it thing. Uh, well, no, let's do it short, you know? Let's, let's, uh, um, but, I don't know, uh, maybe, is somebody, does somebody want to be asked a question specifically that I can ask? How's that? Does anybody want to ask Maybe about the outside project. Yes, Norway. let's talk about Aaron's yeah. project. Aaron's project is amazing. Thank you. Um, Thanks. So, what are you doing with tarring and feathering, Aaron? <laughs> so, my dissertation is about tarring and feathering um, in late colonial America. And a problem that I encountered was that a lot of the evidence um, used a narrative structure that suggested that the violence was funny and that continued to be kind of embedded um, in a lot of scholarship. And I don't really think violence is that funny usually. Um, or, or we should look at other ways it can be understood. Um, so I made a sculpture that looked at the question of different genres to portray tar and feather violence in. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think it's, it's maybe, uh, if we want to do this Q&A, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, it, it might be a, a way of understanding or thinking almost metaphorically about this idea of performing knowledge of, uh, as this object sculpture of knowledge, right? That is something that you kind of study uh, that invites a different um, activity uh, of learning rather than um, this sitting, listening, um, um, and listening in order to, I don't know, um, capture, right? Uh, a meaning uh, that's ongoing. And I, th I think, Today, we have many different kind of dramaturgies, many different ways that this knowledge could have been met by the audience. Uh, sometimes it was like trying to figure out like what's the important part. Sometimes it was um, trying to, you know, come up with your own ideas. I'm thinking about Michelle's performance, for example, that you kind of had to fill in blanks uh, of, of meaning and, and knowledge in that sense. Um, this is not a question. Does anybody want to say anything about that? Uh, how, how they felt that, um, that, what were the demands upon the audience, let's say, in this pseudo-pedagogical situation? I'm not good at Q&As. To get him to dance. Yeah. I just have one observation from earlier today that I was noticing people were listening with their eyes. And mm -hmm. I thought I found that interesting yeah. while Frederick was singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a feeling sometimes that, and I can't remember which performance it was already, but that, oh, I think it was Callens, um, that I didn't want to miss, didn't, didn't want to miss a word, you know? That, that for me it was like, it was a, suddenly a challenge to see what's being said and from where, you know, uh, and also what's being done with the text. And, and suddenly it puts you in a, in a different kind of almost sports like, you know, I'm not, I, I, can, I can do this kind of, uh, I, I can listen to this, I can, I can understand what they're saying type of thing, rather than the kind of, I can read the book, um, which is I think often a, um, a sense that I have. Let's talk about embarrassment for a second, because I think that's uh, a big part of why people don't get up of their seats, um, or why we don't 
you know, um, pursue other means and genres of, uh, or thought action figures. Um, how was dealing with that embarrass embarrassing aspects of today or the kind of stage fright? You know, shame is a part of everyday life, really. Mm -hmm. Really, it's just amplified. When you, <laughs> <laughs> when we have to perform, when we perform in, or when we lecture, when we present, it's a shame amplified. Um, and I think there's this like urge to like frame <coughs> shame or frame this anxiety around as, as um, transformative. <laughs> Not saying, this experience was not transformative because I've been engaging in that conversation all right, but I'm just wondering if, you know, how must we feel that bad to move? Must we? <laughs> um, so I wanted to ask you, especially those of you who are doing this for the first time, how is it different from preparing for a uh, normal, let's say, lecture or a conference, and how was it different, your preparation, but also actually being in front of the audience and engaging with them? Hello, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, we always try to have um, a sort of um, an idea of to whom are we going to talk? Um, and so, and, and for, for this uh, occasion we were, um, I mean, we are thankful that um, we, we could experiment um, in a way, so that put away a bit of the pressure and anxiety of shaming, but yeah, kind of, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I hope at least some messages were clear um, and, and, and it, I also learned that it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a specific message, it, um, giving the liberty to to interpret and, and, and to allow the audience to go where they want to go from what they got from the stage is, is also uh, useful and th that should be um, done more and more, I guess, and maybe also a way to bridge um, the, the distance between the academia and, and the general public. I mean, well, we're definitely not the right people to answer this question because this is basically <laughs> what 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 we do. But I think that in a way, uh, we can. I mean, it, I think that it's really interesting that you asked the question like about embarrassment or shame or discomfort in switching into the genre of of lecture performance or performance lecture, because uh, I been finding it very liberating. And I mean, like, maybe that's because I come from theater and performance backgrounds, so I've been like moving back and forth between academia and, and, and theater like th throughout my life. But uh, uh, that, yeah, I find it in many ways very, very liberating actually to be in this kind of a more, uh, more engaging genre, more creative genre, genre that is more communicative to the audience in a way, so actually it's more anxiety provoking to give like a straight lecture to the audience that <laughs> ex ex expects a straight lecture and is going to like uh, 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 assess it or examine it in a, in a format of this kind of like a very scholarly apparatus, have you got your references right and how did you quote which page? Uh, so uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, this, this is actually uh, less less embarrassing for mm -hmm. for form that, that provides a space for less embarrassment than the usual scholarly paper. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think when you're preparing a lecture, you're trying to think about the easiest way to share as most um, as most information as possible, in, in a way like uh, giving knowledge outside and to be as clear as possible for the for the audience and. Uh, when we were preparing this, we were saying, uh, we were thinking about, okay, there are many things, there are many ideas that the audience are not going to get. There's no way they're going to get. And we need to work with that frustration from the audience. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I, I think this um, this experience allows us to think about knowledge not necessarily as a clear uh, communication, but more as a kind of engagement through frustration and <laughs> from both of us, from both parts, from part of the public that okay, there as a part of the audience, I'm I'm not understanding complete, uh, completely what you're saying because it's not, it's not linear. It's not as clear as possible. It's, it's not the clearest way of communicating this idea, so I'm not getting everything. Mm -hmm. And as a communicator, as someone who's trying to share an idea, it's okay. I'm not going to try to share as, mo as much information I can, but I will try to do this in a, the, the best possible way or the most engaging way I could mm -hmm. think of. So uh, another kind of aspect I think to think about in relation to these things is the, um, let's say, social or peer pressure almost uh, in understanding. You know, when you see people nodding, it means that you should have been understanding something. Um, some, so, something it was right, you know, like there's that. So I think, Kalan, you, A, have not spoken yet, and B, um, really kind of targeted uh, the group aspect of of an audience, you know, of of, of the of the lecture performance, or I mean, that specific theatrical potential. Mm -hmm. Would you like to speak of that? Sure. Um, well, I think we when we talked about doing this as a performance, it was about outsourcing self presentation, which is inherently a very performative act, right? And it's something that we all partake in. Um, whatever level of participation that we choose, either like the high, the you know, highly conscious level of self-presentation, um, or the like performance of um, not caring about how you dress as well. Um, so I think in engaging the crowd, we wanted to think about how dispersing both the narrators like throughout the different types of text or the different kind of like levels of cognition that are happening and then also physically in the space. What that would be, like. how, how that might like both obfuscate and then also bring people into the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it, did, it was very interesting to understand yourself as either like in front of something mm -hmm. or within that something, you know. Yeah, the relationship of like the Identity also being about formed an objection, like you're either. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> Are there any questions from the uh, knowledge performers? Two, two of them. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> so I'm really interested that you put on this here, and what does that mean? Because I'm interested in graduate student training, and as you guys may have heard, there's a crisis, especially in humanities with what? graduate students getting jobs and stuff. And, no. uh, and so one thing that uh, we are trained to speak pr in almost from the get-go to very specialized audiences. And so we learn the jargon, we learn to make these arguments, and oftentimes we love what we, can, we do and we can't imagine doing anything else, and that's a problem because, yeah, so I'm, in I'm interested in how this came about and is this something that's part of, of the, the program here, Peter? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe Peter can answer that. Yeah. I, think, I think that question was directed to Peter, our EO. You guys put it now. You answer first. Um, well, then, like technically, technically, I think the short answer is no. Um, it's not part of my art curriculum. Um, it's something that we wanted to do because we feel that. Um, well, I'll speak for myself. I think. Studying theater and performance cannot just be the history, sociology, anthropology, and uh, of theater and performance. Um, it it needs to to understand. We I think we need to be able to understand the theatricality of things, um, and to develop it, not just to understand it, to kind of produce it. Um, so that's that's kind of where I, you know, and then and then with. It, it comes together because there is the Siegel Center at the Graduate Center whose mandate is to connect between academia and theater. Um, and so uh, we gently and politely knocked on the door um, and Frank said, come in. 
And uh, so we came in, and this has been an ongoing relationship that's kind of, I think, maturing nicely, well, I hope. Do you want to, want to say anything, Peter, about no, that? No, I think you said it very well. I think it's, um, it's about a relationship between uh, the, the teaching program and the PhD. And I, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I came here five years ago from Australia, and I've worked a lot in Australia and Europe. And I think the relationship between theory and practice is more articulated in PhD programs elsewhere. So uh, in that sense, I think what we're doing is a little bit catching up but also a, a little bit moving in different directions because we do have this pretty unique relationship here between a teaching program, a PhD program in theatre and performance and a public programs, um, and the possibility of moving between them and recognising the work that, um, that the Siegel Centre does as a kind of knowledge, as a kind of research practice is, is really important. It's a dramaturgy, you know, so as I, I you know, um, in, in regards to the, the possibility of the future, yeah, absolutely. I mean, PhD training is done for all sorts of reasons in many parts of the world. Uh, Mid-career artists do PhDs to work on problems. Um, uh, um, theorists work on PhDs because they want to get tenure-track jobs. I mean, we really need to open the, the, the whole idea of doing a PhD up to a lot of um, possibilities. Um, and uh, so that will take time because in this jurisdiction it, it needs to be restructured somewhat to, to enable that to happen. A bit more Deleuzean perhaps. Um, but, you know, it's, it's step by step. Thank you. I have a question for you guys. Will you train me to be a thought action? <laughs> okay. I, I'm, not, I'm less interested in PhD training, I'm more interested in that's the most wonderful thing that could come out from this, from our performance. <laughs> yes, definitely. I just um, checked one, two. <laughs> that was perfect, right? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say that um, Amir and Mara's intersection with what we were working on was so effective and um, the way they um, communicated just little, their ideas that would like urge what we were doing on in like really big ways with just minimal uh, impulses. And um, you know, both motivating us but like getting us um, more, you know, activated about our own uh, uh, ideas. Um, so I wanted to thank you guys, and I, I think there's work for you. <laughs> like, Somewhere doing before. that, you know, uh, with all kinds of professions, y you know? It kind of taking the other fields off the page. Um, and I also wanted to say that I feel like um, I, well, I'm a teacher, I teach music to elementary children. <laughs> but we're always um, pressed for, you know, where, um, what's the point of entry for the learner or the audience and the kind of space that lives in this style as opposed to just the lecture um, really gives the listener the chance to grab on, like from their own um, interests sometimes, or there's just more breadth, I think, in it, a more um, vast, more pl uh, playing area. And um, so, and, and it's, it's more fun for everybody, I think, but um, I think the takeaways can be more like organic for the, the um, listeners. Does that make sense? Yeah. I was thinking something similar, which is that I think a lot of the pieces that were put on today were about creating, like, oh, most many through sensory overload, like more of an exploratory space for people. And I think it's interesting to think about how many people wanted to produce work like that also. Um, and that, that there was like a really, there was a response to the call, I think shows that um, there's a desire that's not just about like the job market drying up, but also I think um, maybe more like 
celebratory reasons that people are excited <laughs> about creating work that's public facing. Mm -hmm. Well, does anybody else have any more questions? Or comments or anything? so much for your time and your generosity um, in helping us build this. It's been really a pleasure to, oh, we have, we have a present for you. Okay. Um, it's probably outside. But please um, join us at the archive on 36th Street, um, two streets up for some drinks and celebrations and congratulations. Um, Amir will be right back with the bags. <laughs> Hopefully, Amir. Um, <laughs> the archive is between fifth and fifth between what avenues? There it is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll do this this way. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>